<clears throat> All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Long Thoughts podcast. Uh, I'm Rob Richardson. I'm once again joined by my colleague, Bob Seidenswartz. And today uh, we have a, a wonderful return guest, uh, Jennifer Warren. Bob, do you want to kind of kick off our yeah. introduction here? Yeah. Uh, uh, once again, wonderful to see you in person uh, as we frequently talk on the phone. Uh, Jennifer is the sole proprietor of Concept Elemental, a advisory, um, how, how would I, you, your work is so varied, Jennifer. Um, how, how would you describe Concept Elemental, the work that you do and your place within the industry? Sure, well, I mean, Concept Elemental is really kind of a boutique advisory firm and I do quite a bit in communications and marketing for clients um, and that can be varied um, but I also have um, an expertise in energy and and resources that I've developed over time just from some of my publishings and just involvement in energy and so those two sometimes intersect so there's you know two two things an expertise and then a skill set connected to strategy communications advisory for clients um, and sometimes they overlap so that and you have uh, specific clients that you work with that on an advisory basis um use your services for the work and inside. And then of course, your outlook for various industry uh, components as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my outlook often can be, you know, at a speaking engagement or an investor road show, or, you know, it can really vary. I mean, it's very bespoke and it's very context specific, you know, for the, for the clients, so. Right. And speaking of speaking engagements, uh, we've had the pleasure of having you up here in Montana twice uh, with another visit coming in April as we put on the Central Southwest Asian Conference. And the information that uh, is still in the evolving process, but some pretty exciting potential for something very uh, dynamic and unique in terms of some of the work that you do when you come back here to Montana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm definitely looking forward to advancing the conversation because it seems like it's sort of an ongoing conversation. Right, you know, right. Ever evolving, like the industry. Yeah, from, from last. Well, and just the industry touches other industries and sometimes certain industries like technology are more visible, you know, in the forefront than at other times, especially now. So, um, so yeah, I keep... I keep delving in and and sort of you know trying to uncover what is going on, what's the trend, and you know what what's happening with energy. How's it intersecting with the broader economy? What are the drivers? You know all that. Um, so th that's actually a perfect opportunity to kind of as as discussed previously. How do we connect the dots here in terms of really very varied components? As you mentioned, technology. Uh, the infrastructure aspect of the business, the renewables. There's so many things that are happening right now. And you've recently presented at a conference in New York City. Tell us a little bit about that and kind of the essence of that presentation and discussion. Yeah, so that was um, the a New York City Investor Summit. And it was really an amazing day. And I mean, they had you know, crypto a crypto panel they had you know top economists um it was but my specifically i talked about energy infrastructure and um also some of this new industrial activity connected to some of the reshoring that that is happening and also connected to the demand with you know data center growth um they're all it's all connected together and so i presented that just looking at what are the drivers and the trends and you know trying to look at you know and it and it it's oil and gas but it's also connected to you know electrification um so the you know kind of toggling between those two from my oil and gas vantage point but playing it forward with with what's going on so as we will get deeper into what you're just describing. It would be interesting from our perspective, and I know our listeners, what kind of response did you get back from some of the people that were there for the presentation? Um, it, it, you know, any areas of surprise, aha moments, 
um, kind of like, ah, the light went on. I really didn't understand or realize until we had the discussion that you were presenting. So yeah. any particular insights that were of interest? Well, I mean, I, I think because, you know, and this is more recently that really the data center AI, you know, phenomenon has really been to, at the fore. But this was back in June when I was presenting and and I had I had been connecting those dots for a while anyway, also connected to, you know, reshoring, advanced manufacturing, like the chips, you know, the new fabs. Um, and um, so I was kind of looking at what the power, you know, what the energy demands were going to be about about that. Um, and also I presented some about, um, you know, midstream infrastructure, just kind of observing that, because I was talking about investment themes, right? And so I was pulling out what I thought were, you know, aside from just the basic fundamentals of oil and gas investing, I was looking at infrastructure investing and, you know, and also how it was connected to new industrial activity, which has to do also with this digital infrastructure, you know, which is really the broad term for for all of it, you know, this whole ecosystem, if you will, um, you know. And you can also say, well, there's an a, you know, there's an AI ecosystem, and but you know, people use different terms. But I think what, I mean, it was really across the board what the interest was from the audience. Some had some specific questions about you know, energy transfer. Um, some wanted to know about, you know, things happening in Texas and the grid. But what I can say, the reception, you know, it was like an hour long. I was constantly fielding questions. And then for a full hour after the reception ended, I was fielding questions. People just wanting to talk about whatever was on their mind. It could even be an individual company. So it was across the board interest in energy and everything it touches basically Rob, some questions yeah no i just thinking about that right like we hear a lot um you know as sort of the ai and investment in ai has sort of driven the, the market narrative probably the last two years you see a lot of questions of well how do you you know how do you play this other than you know like a chip manufacturer other than like the big um, tech companies, right? And so it really does, we see a lot of interest too in, in trying to understand how that trickles down uh, to, yeah, infrastructure, the grid, energy, right? The sort of basic unit of input, you know, you have to have the electricity in order to power this. So it's kind of interesting to hear that this is a, a broad-based theme, people trying to figure out, okay, well, how does this happen? And <clears throat> so from your, I, I guess, from your understanding, um, what are sort of like the big things that need to to happen as a result of sort of all this AI demand? Or, or what does the infrastructure look like? Are we um, are we adequately prepared, or is there a lot of investment that needs to happen still? Yeah, I mean it's a huge question, and I think you know analysts are just starting to kind of put out reports you know there was one by goldman sachs that they tried yeah. to quantify all of it and 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 they hit the mark on a lot of things now you know one trillion dollars spending i just heard you know five trillion <laughs> you know i mean you get different forecasts and scenarios but what i can say just from what i have experienced who i've talked to and what i see is that there are a lot of varied constraints depending on your region you know for example hmm. yeah. virginia, virginia okay virginia's right. data center capital right you know and they're definitely pushing up against you know the constraints of having you know power generation that's going to match demand interestingly you know there was this one um earnings call i listened in on listened in on and and, and a lot of their growth actually was coming from Dallas. You know, we're the number two largest data center market. Um, and so that was kind of interesting um, because we have a free energy market in, in Texas and at ERCOT. And right. so our dynamics are different and, and we can kind of move faster than, you know, like say PJM, you know, with 13 states connected to it, which includes Virginia. Right. Um, so we have a unique situation in, in that we have our own grid 
Um, but we have constraints too, to do with like our grids around, you know, 85 gigawatts and, you know, right now the projection is that like, I think it's by 2030 or so it could almost double. Now that's Herculean. And, and the challenge is that there's a physical reality that has to happen to match this innovation and, and the right. forecast and construction can only move so fast. Um, Microsoft is spending a ton of money. I can't remember like 30 to 40 billion, you know, in CapEx for land and construction basically, um, you know, to, to, to meet all this, you know, future investment, but they even said it's going to, you know, this is like a 15 year, you know, prospect for them, what they're, what they have in mind. And so I think, I think there's a lot of forecasts. There's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and, and I, and I think there's going to be a lot of varied performance by region, by resources accessible, um, by regulation, by all sorts of factors, the economy, um, the demand for data, you know, um, you know, there's, there's some pushback even in Texas, you know, I just saw some of the first kind of like, you know, one problem with data centers is, you know, they're not, um, they don't hire a lot of people, you know, it's not a big job. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. A, a lot of space, but yeah, not a lot of people needed to. Run yeah. Off. So it gets at this, you know, what is, what is valuable, what is value. And, you know, so there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think this is a, and Bob and I discussed this. I think this is a really unscripted area and it's just going to be going in fits and starts, you know? Um, yeah, that, that seems right. I mean, so, so from an energy or perspective, I mean, what needs to happen in sort of the ener energy industry, aside from just, you know, building up the utilities, like a, a grid, you know, kind of even a more basic level, what needs to happen then with our sort of energy uh, production to, to sort of ramp for this, these varied forecasts? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can only produce resources so fast for right. one. Um, and I've seen some of the numbers of this um, second quarter earnings that have come out. You know, I've looked at a few players here and there and just kind of seen what their forecasts are. And, you know, maybe, some, and I mean, this is all new work in progress, if you will. Um, and there isn't a holistic analysis at present. Um, so it's very, there's not really even a holistic strategy, right? Like, yeah, everybody's kind of trying to do their own thing. Well, and you know what? You, the um, the regions, the the grids, the region, the grids are, you know, chopped up in regions, right? And and so there's not one federal national grid, you know, right. it's it's per region, you know. So that's also where you you're gonna get this variation. So you can't even say one size fits all, right? It's going to be very, I think, targeted in some respects. Um and and they're still going to require scale, you know, to have lower so that you're not you know, hindering the rate payer because the rate payer is going along for the ride with the grid, right? And and that is something that, you know, could reveal. I mean, honestly, if all the demand manifests, like the, the best case scenario, the most ambitious scenario, it could well be inflationary. Right. If, then you got the Fed hitting the brakes again and then dialing back those projects. So, I mean, I think really measured a measured approach is going to happen physically it has to happen regulatory has to happen you know um so you know it's it's really going to be interesting because there's a market driven aspect with the ai demand the data center demand but then there's this whole regulated side to do with utilities you know and 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 just public acceptance you know um so so Jennifer, as I'm listening to this, as somebody that's been involved in this for a number of years, I can kind of compartmentalize pretty quickly what you're saying. But when you're in the situation where you're making a public presentation, and this could even be to a kind of novice audience as well as very sophisticated, you're preparing kind of a feature for the fall energy conference, which is coming up in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So as you're as you're mentioning all these different variables, 
And I can see just a boatload of potential problems because this is not a straight line from A to Z. No. This is so yeah. as you're preparing this feature for the presentation, what's going to be kind of the emphasis on this? And how much of what you're saying right now is going to be incorporated into that? Because at the end of the day, as, as Rob and I in our industry and the work you do, we have to be able to explain this in language mm. that helps people compartmentalize and understand so they don't walk out of the room just going, sounded great, but I don't know what the hell you're talking about. There's just too many moving parts here. Yeah. And that's one of the real issues that I see with this entire discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So what you're referring to is the the feature I've been working on. Right. You know, it's a written feature. Um, and I and I started in earnest with interviews in June, the end of June. And then the event um, is actually, I mean, it, there's an awards event and I may or may not be doing a little preview because they don't, they don't let the print thing edition come out until the night of the event. So people can't <laughs> see it. Um, yeah. And, but I started conceptualizing, I've been conceptualizing about it for a year and a half, if you think about it. And it's just gotten to this point where, for example, in Montana, I was really looking at, you know, big picture trends with energy and then some of this new industrial economic activity. And then at, C at, at the summit this summer, I was really looking at the investment themes connected to all those trends. You know, how is it playing out in the investment world? But now what I've done is I've married what's happening with business. What are businesses actually doing? And, and so I started, funny enough, when I first started conceiving this, I was really, I was going to be looking at, you know, oil and gas. Oh, there's a lot of M&A activity. You know, there was 200, almost 240 billion last year. There's, you know, I don't even know what it is now. The first quarter, it was like 75 billion. You know, it's it's going to be, you know, significant, um, but not like 2023. Um, and so I was looking at it from that lens. I was like, well, what is this going to mean? for energy, you know, and, but what happened as I started, you know, just kind of moving along through time and thinking about the North Texas angle, you know, um, I had to look at who I could speak with that would, you know, kind of be part of our mandate with what I, the feature I'm working on and the area it's connected to, but I had to actually pull in a a few people from Austin, um, you know, for some expertise, because that's where a lot of the grid action happens. Um, and, and so, so that was one thing, but I, but I really spoke to a cross section of, you know, oil and gas producers, midstream firms, a grid expert, um, people connected to data centers, uh, that sort of thing. So I kind of, I ended up investigating really um and i didn't plan that to just try to understand what is going on you know and where is the puck going right um so rob so when you, when you mentioned several things one part of this that i'm starting to see some some issues pop up these data centers as you mentioned will not at some point employ a lot of people when constructed. But the construction phase, mm -hmm. the land acquisition, um, the effect on housing, the infrastructure needs, uh, water, um, just a host of issues that often we don't think about in terms of what the impact would be. Are you seeing some issues that are starting to become problematic when one of these wants to be built, especially in an area that may be more rural, Mm. does not have the development infrastructure. And then you're talking about big impacts on people's quality of life, yeah. cost of living, things of that nature. So right. is this another possible impediment to this grand idea of these centers being built across the country? Yeah. And I think it's, and I think it gets really down to, you know, the markets, right? There's, you know, first tier, second tier data center, you know, um, areas. And, and the first tier is that, you know, they want to build 
you know, where the data is to be closer, you know, because the power has to reach that and the infrastructure is there and, and that sort of thing. Then you have these secondary markets. And, and, and I've heard that there's, you know, definitely some activity in those. But no, you get at the point of what you're getting at is the competition between, you know, land, resources, you know, society, all this. I know that there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just talking about, you know, there was some development in this um, this smaller town outside of Austin. And, you know, they were bumping up against the problems with water availability, you know, a whole housing development and, and development, but there's not the, you know, you need the water, you know, you need the power, you need the water, you need all this. So, so it's not different for data centers. It's the same thing. And you're competing, you know, that land and that, you know, infrastructure and access to power, you know, you're competing with other, you know, projects, if you will, for, for that. But the thing about big tech is they have deep pockets, right? So um, this is the challenge. And I, th I think, you know, it's- Yeah, that's, th that's a really interesting question um, that I don't know if I'd thought much about, right? Yeah, you're competing with Obviously, you know, there's only so much land and competing with housing as well, especially considering, you know, in this country for probably the, more than the last decade, we've really underbuilt housing supply. And right. now to the, to get in a land war, so to speak, with tech, which you're right, has very deep pockets, could, could be really interesting, you know, from a supply and demand impact on price of housing, which has been a, a key point over, you know, the last several years, housing affordability has been a big issue. And now, you know, with, with data centers certainly could make it worse. Uh, and from a, I think to your point, from a social perspective, you know, if we don't see a real end market use for AI and, and data centers that is meaningful, uh, that may become very unpopular very quickly, I would think. Right. Like, I mean, how I would kind of characterize it is there's the market, stock market, and all the excitement and all the money, yeah. all the trading, all that. And then there's the real economy, which is where we live, how we how we move, how it's the it's a physical reality, right? You know, yeah. the stock market is 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 an intangible reality connected to a physical reality <laughs> right you and know? they can deviate quite a bit yeah yeah and so you get this you know the the momentum and all that but then you know one one comment that i i recall in an interview was just that you know frankly the fact that there are physical constraints on infrastructure and the ability to get a substation and all this stuff that can act as a break you know, on breakneck activity, right? Um, that's not a bad thing because you really don't want booms and busts in this. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, to me, I see these parallels with shale development. You know, um, yeah. I, I keep seeing, you know, you know, because they're, you know, I've monitored that, right? That's kind of been, you know, what I've chronicled, and you know, two two decades of shale with booms and busts and all the things that happen. So it's the same, right? We there's there isn't going to be a straight line. It isn't going to be linear growth, most mm -hmm. likely, right? Um, and so yeah. I think I think when you think about it like that, then you kind of take a breath, you know, and 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 sit back a little bit. But but it's difficult because you know on earnings calls in the market. I mean, everybody just wants to hype and pump, <laughs> you know? So um, that's kind of interesting. Could you think of like, um, I'm trying to think of, I, I like this idea you're sort of proposing of this boom and bust cycle with, with data centers. Would you, would you think like of the big tech companies, not as like the big EMPs, but more like the actual plays, you know, like Microsoft is like the Permian or something like that, where there's just this opportunity for lots of money to be, uh, you know, spent and generated and all that kind of stuff. No, I mean, I, I I mean, what are you asking exactly? So I'm and you're trying to think of like the boom and bust, right? Yeah. Like you have like these different um, basins, uh -huh. right? Sort of kick off at different times, and there's right. this opportunity where like right. lots of things, lots of investment are going into these specific yeah. 
Mercury is in, like in, the Permian, in, like yeah, Permian yeah. or the or the Wilson or. So are you suggesting Bakken. Microsoft is the Permian? Yeah. <laughs> no, and, hey, right. stop! Like, interesting. It, it's an interesting connection. If you're now. Nvidia, right? Yeah. Like you're. Yeah. You're you guys so are writing my next story. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, we're, we're um, forward leaning thinkers here. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's really, yeah. I mean, truly, yeah. Okay. So who's who's the gorilla in the room? <laughs> so the Permian's mm -hmm. the gorilla in the oil and gas room, right? Right. right. That's right. And um, you know, the gorilla is, well, are you looking at like Microsoft has a kind of a different, a little bit of a different model, but still some of the value capture of a big value capture of AI, right? Right. NVIDIA has a certain type of value capture, you know, that's a bit different than what Microsoft yeah. is, right? Very so yeah. so you have these worlds that are both trying to collide together and 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 leverage each other, you know, but there's competition. So the competition is what's going to get really interesting, I think, in the future. Um, because we're just starting to see firms breaking out a little bit different. I mean, look at Apple, you know, they came out and they're like, okay, we're all about privacy, AI, you know, and so everyone got excited about that. And that was what the market wanted to hear, you know, because AI is scary at times, you know, yes. <clears throat> you know, especially for individuals um, and firms and, and, but, but you have this playing out on the enterprise level, right. On the firm mm -hmm. level. Um, and so it's really difficult and some have leads, right. And some have deep, deep pockets. So mm -hmm. I think, I think it's just, I don't think there's a one size fits all again. I think it's really varied and you, and, and you have to, you have to do some due diligence, right? I mean, this is going to require a lot of due diligence to get this right and not get burned, <laughs> you know? So Jennifer, one of the, well, I'm absolutely fascinated by this and, and I, I want your comments and insights. We're, we're talking about something that maybe not unique in the world, but I think it's unique that the U.S. is the entrepreneurial capital of the world. Mm -hmm. We would not even be having this conversation if we didn't have some of these cowboys out there <laughs> in Texas and various places that were taking incredible risk yeah. to develop the resources to use cutting edge technology, in, in which case many times something failed, tried again, failed, tried again. But if we didn't have the energy industry develop along the path and the risk takers that really developed this amazing infrastructure, mm -hmm. the wildcatters to the big you know, firms, to the infrastructure boys, we wouldn't even be having this conversation because it wouldn't be possible to deliver the right. resources to make such yeah. an AI center even a reality. So talk yeah. a little bit about that and also contrast that with, are there other countries that are even similar to us? Because our, as we said earlier, it's kind of messy here. Mm -hmm. But from that comes some of the most amazing innovations. Yeah. Well, what I would say is, I mean, going back to the Montana presentation, I really laid out the case that, in fact, the shale revolution has set us up to be doing all the things we're doing right now. Because all this infrastructure, all this capacity, all this know-how and technology advancement is facilitating all of this AI, data center, digital infrastructure. Were it not for that, wouldn't you know? Wouldn't be possible. It would be more patchy, like in Europe, right? Um, and and one thing is for sure: there's a reason why a lot of the reshoring is coming here, right? There's a reason why um, you know, e even our our consolidating oil and gas industry they're just getting more efficient all the time. Uh, yeah. I was in a, 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 I guess a tech room for an oil producer about a month ago. And I was completely blown away at the 3d seismic um, technology and what they could do, how much they can produce in a, in a cube, you know, it was extraordinary. And this is, you know, this is, two decades later to get to that point, you know, um, and with, you know, 400 people 
could, you know, were needed for a $4 billion cap oil and gas firm. Whereas if you look at like cap firms, you know, in other industries, you're talking thousands of people, you know, so they're super hyper efficient. And, and, you know, this, this technology, this know-how, I mean, some of it's starting to get exported to other countries, you know, where they have, um, you know, oil and gas resources. Um, but no, this, this advanced economy phenomenon, I think it's, you know, I mean, it's happening here and um, sure other countries are gonna, you know, it's going to get replicated some in time, but um, you know, we're kind of getting a little bit into my feature, so I can't, I can't discuss anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I think that's one of the real interesting things about, yeah, sort of on your point, Bob, with uh, just sort of the innovation, especially in the, you know, energy industry is, is you can, um, you can track you know, the, the cost per barrel to, to get oil mm -hmm. out of the ground right. and, and how that has changed over time. Um, it, it's one of the few industries where you can directly see that innovation resulting in like cost savings. And, and I can imagine that as we tend to buckle on certain advances that, as I said, without this first, you don't see what is this AI and the development in the centers. That probably is still going to happen, but it couldn't function in a way that we see coming. But now, can we not use the advances in AI? to further enhance the work that the oil and gas industry is doing. So when you're talking about efficiency, when you're talking about using what you just described as far as uh, you know these 3D seismic, I, I see the ability to use in time mm. the information that comes from the advanced AI to mm. further build upon efficiencies already in place. Oh, sure. I mean, because it's just scraping data, right? I mean, AI exactly. is really about scraping yeah. data and using yeah. it and slicing and dicing. And they're really good. I mean, I mean, the oil and gas industry is like probably one of the most sophisticated data users around the globe, you know, and, and they've had a long time coming in it. So, um, you know, yeah, yes, they, they, they will take advantage. I, I'm, I'm sure it's happen happening in pockets, but, um, you know, I I think really with what's in the forefront right now in the news and everything, I mean, really the big, a lot of the big stuff is, you know, LLMs and generative AI, it seems to have captured the imagine, imagination, but there's, you know, definitely machine learning going on and predictive analytics, you know, all that's, you know, going to happen is happening, um, but it's not, it's not really, you know, something top of mind i think with oil and gas producers they're more interested in oh wow you know we're gonna have to you know pump more natural gas and connect more natural gas to utilities and industrial users for this demand you know so i i think that's kind of and and you and we have a private market i mean publicly traded but private market right it's private players so you know, it's not going to be like a big United States wide effort, if you will, you know, um, and well, it's, it's probably been... a good thing, <laughs> you know, frankly, you don't want one, you don't want a monopoly in this, you know. We um, don't want a sovereign oil company in the United States, as you see in many countries where those assets are not owned by private sector, right. they're owned by governmental entities. And I think that's one of the big distinguishing features between the U.S. and many other companies, excuse me, countries that yep. produce oil and gas. Right. Well, it's why we do it so well is because we have competition. Right. You know? I mean, I mean, the oil and gas industry is highly competitive, you know, um, even even with these mergers, you know, sure, you have some consolidation and you've got some Walmarts going on and things like that, but you still have a ton of innovation and you know, a reshuffling um, of the of the market, if you will, and and we don't know how it's going to shuffle out yet. You know, right. um, so so kind of along those those lines, um, from a I guess uh, M and A consolidation, uh, regulatory kind of all that kind of it, it's an election year. Mm -hmm. um, 
what sort of impact could it like a regime change have on either sort of the uh, regulatory process for one getting more infrastructure online uh, and or two in making you know extraction either easier or harder right kind of depending on how things happen yeah I mean honestly neither party can affect this that much because we are a private market what the can affect though is you know pipelines you know maybe 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 there's some favorability to build more pipelines and you know the Marcellus you know to get some of that gas down to demand centers, i.e., you know, the Gulf Coast for LNG and that sort of thing. That's one of the bottlenecks, you know, that's that's been. And but, you know, you also have states, right? You know, pipelines crossing state lines. So this this is going to be a bit of a challenge, I think. But I mean, there can be some support. But at the end of the day, um, I I don't think it's really going to matter that much. You know, I mean, yeah, if it's a Trump administration, there might be some more favorability on pipelines being built, you know, the, them trying to kind of influence that. But at the end of the day, too, the market's not going to get ahead of the market. You know, we've seen this with policy with the IRA legislation. You know, the policy has been pulling the market. So it's it's become, you know, kind of supply driven dense. And, and that's a problem for the queues, right? And um, and and for the grid as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we've seen a little bit of the pitfalls of, of policy juicing up energy too much, you know, because because then what can happen is, you know, we don't want, um, you know, graveyards full of, you know, wind turbines and, and solar panels because of overbuilding, you know, and speculation. And then the subsidy, you know, I yeah. mean, we're indebted, you know, and, and anything further that you do to put kerosene on energy when, you know, the market really needs to work it out. I mean, you can find ways to support the market, but I don't think you should be boosting the market. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer, I, I'm afraid that politicians will be politicians. Uh, so <laughs> they want to spend. <laughs> they want to spend. The they gotta, yeah, on. they got to respond to uh, their markets. Yeah. Which is, I will promise you the world if you elect yeah. me. Right. So we're always going to be in these tensions, which is what makes this system sometimes it just, I step back and go, how the does it yeah. even work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. There's so many hurdles and issues that are just constantly having to be dealt with. So uh, another component of this too, which is my madness, what we've done with our oil and gas industry and, and our renewables to a degree, the US is one of the leading producers, if not the leading producer of energy in the world mm -hmm. at the current time. This has really major strategic geopolitical implications for us as well. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I mean, I mean, from a big picture point of view, yeah, I mean, we're like, 13.7 million barrels a day of oil production in a 102 million barrel a day market, meaning we're well over 10%. Um, you know, that's a good thing. We're exporting more LNG. We will be exporting more LNG. And, and that's a good thing as well. Um, I And I, so I think just us being in the trading game more is a geopolitically advantageous. And so there doesn't, you know, we don't want obstacles to that. Um, and as far as electrification goes, you know, that's so country specific. And because even as we're talking, it's very region specific, different levels of development with economies. Um, you know, we know that, for example, like India is growing quite a bit and trying to, you know, have set up more infrastructure, you know, to, to grow its economy and all that has to come together. Um, but what underlies, you know, and they're doing a lot of renewables, but you still have this just imperative vital oil and gas industry. And so I think if anything, you know, the Russia-Ukraine situation has really shown that, you know, 
what, why it matters to have energy production and the fact that we're an energy producer that is, you know, capitalistic, you know, we're not a, an authoritarian regime trying to control, you know, a global market because of our sway, you know? So I think that's one of the best things we have going for us, you know, in that respect. Well, and for me, there was a, a compelling example with our LNG exports that are now going to Europe. Mm -hmm. And there's others that are also shipping LNG. But as a result of Russia's invasion with Ukraine, a lot of relationship issues that had been kind of in the shallows between the EU and the US really came to the fore, mm -hmm. especially military cooperation. But having that natural gas shut off from Russia really caused the US and the EU to even get closer from the standpoint of, hey, we can fill some of that void. Right. And as a result of filling that void, it has consequences for other components of your relationship from trade to, to security issues and so forth. But this all comes about in the US because I want you to describe to our listeners the significance of our natural gas production mm -hmm. in this country and what that has meant both to our domestic as well as our ability to ship LNG. Yeah. No, I mean the natural the natural gas side is is really vital because natural gas, you know, is used for power generation. Natural gas is used as fertilizer, so it has to do with, you know, food supply, global food supply. Um, you know, and and the fact that I mean, we're the biggest producer of natural gas in the world and and with prices so low, you know, our prices, you know, we do need that relief valve of export. Um, I, and I, so I think it's generally healthy, you know, for the United States. And it's not, even though we're exporting, we're not pushing up prices, you know, um, and for U.S. consumers at all, um, because we're market driven too. Um, but, you know, I just, I think in, you know, if you look ahead, Natural gas is one of the chief um, um, sources of energy that grows, especially it's kind of an Asia leaning story. And so I, I think the fact that we export there as well, you know, is a real positive. Right. I mean, and, and just that we're playing, you know, just that we're trading, we can be trading with allies. We can be trading with, you know, not such friendly countries. We ship LNG to China. But we need to be trading, you know, and, and we need to have, we need to, you know, kind of honor the market is the market and, and these economies need resources. And so I, I don't think it's a bad thing that there is some, some interdependence, you know. Right. Rob, I've got only about 15 more questions, but uh, <laughs> I, I would like to stop and give you an opportunity or Jennifer, there's certain topics and issues that you would like to continue to flush out as well. Mm, you know, not really. I mean, the only thing I could say is, you know, and we, this was kind of something we talked about was, you know, the idea that, you know, with AI, you know, tech, um, the push for growth, all that, you know, it, it actually kind of works against the physical reality. And we've talked, we've talked about this, you mm -hmm. know, that, infrastructure, resource development, energy, you know, energy provision, it can only move so fast because there's a, a physical, you know, relationship <laughs> to the earth with it and, and people, how fast people can move. The idea of, you know, you know, everything's going to, you know, we're going to just turn the handle and we're going to be using AI for everything. And we're going to, mm -hmm. you know, you know, replace half the population and <laughs> all that stuff. Not going to happen that way. You know, it's just not going to happen in the way that we think it could happen. I think it's going to be different <laughs> than what we're imagining. And and but our imagination has captured the idea of innovation. But innovation moves at a much faster pace than than the physical reality. And so, you know, in our minds, I mean, we can create anything in a second, right? Um, AI can, could do it, you know. <laughs> But there's a physical reality that's always going to constrain things, and that's a good thing. Um, so that's just kind of something that I've been working on for like 
over two years, you know, um, just theorizing and, and, and testing and experimenting and, and inquiring, you know. So I wonder about what something we said earlier it, it, on our side of the table, it, it's the excitement, you know, the market, uh, the things that move very quickly and tend to get quite a bit ahead of the physical reality. Mm. So where is that nexus where people like yourself and others that are out there telling this story, uh, going to these, uh, um, you know, summits to be able to speak, are people from our end of it starting to listen more carefully to help them maybe possibly reassess and think about what we're saying, which of course has an effect on investors and can move markets, but is not often in sync what you just said. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think there is starting to be more, um, you know, information coming to light and analysis coming to light about the meaning of it. And I, but a lot of it has to do on, you know, what side of that trade you're on, you know, and what you're pushing, what your right. agenda is. Right. Um, so it's going to take all sorts of, you know, information intermediaries, whether it's, you know, journalism, um, analysts, crowdsourced analysis, unbiased analysis, um, you know, so I think it's just evolving. And I think it's so mm -hmm. new that, I mean, even I am trying to figure out, you know, how do I quantify some of this, you know, because yeah, Goldman Sachs can produce a report and crank out some numbers and pull together a bunch of experts and, and it's great. And I'm glad they're doing that. But there's a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of facets and, and there's a lot of moving parts, right? So for me, I'm trying to like pick my part right where I can see through, you know, the clutter and the noise and, 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 you know, and also at the same time, try to read the tea leaves with that a little bit. Right. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of a, a big, to the, to your point on like the forecast and things, big believer in, in that we greatly overestimate our ability to, to forecast with, especially with any sort of precision. Right. So, so try to put, you know, one to five trillion dollar range. <laughs> it's a, it's a huge, What's huge a few trillion range. amongst friends? Right. <laughs> right. Even that may yeah. be like widely off. Right. You, you know, right. Right. to your point is it, it's still so early and, and so dynamic that, that we just don't know exactly, like to your point, we don't know how this is really going to play out. Right. Well, and we mentioned very early on the amount of capital that has to be raised for these projects somebody's going to do an analysis and say, well, we'll give you a trillion for your chip plant. Uh, we expect that within mm -hmm. two years, your chip plant will be built and we can start seeing a return on investment. Well, guess what? They start kicking that two year process down to three years, yeah. four, five years. And all of a sudden the capital allocation starts looking very different in terms of that ROI yeah. and a whole lot of other factors. So hopefully you're not spending a trillion to build a, a, a a, a chip fab, but yeah. We, yeah, uh, yeah, please uh, correct me if I'm just, <laughs> I'm throwing out imaginary numbers here, but the, but, the, but the point is often, and Jennifer, you've said this now a number of times, the predictability of this is really variable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, and it covers so much ground. Uh, go ahead, please. Well, I was just, I was just going to pivot back to what you were saying. And here's some numbers actually on uh, fabs. Um, so the Samsung chip plant that I talked about in Montana, you know, initially, I can't remember what the initial amount was. Oh, 17 billion was the initial CapEx, you know, what it was going to cost. Then it grew to 30 billion. And, and then now they're adding another fab and it's like 44 billion is, is the amount. And, and, and so far though, with Samsung, I mean, things look pretty much a go, you know, but then you have other cases of other firms where they're struggling, you know, and they've had to have like, you know, Apollo, you know, chip in, you know, 5 billion or something, you know, so you, so you see these getting to your point about profit, ultimate profitability, you know, what you're investing in. Um, so I think you see also different horses in different lanes with this, right? And, and 
you know, the setup with Samsung is that, you know, there's a lot of resources. There's, you know, in, they're near Austin, which is a, a tech capital of Texas. So there's like a, there's a, like an ecosystem there that's supportive aside from having the right infrastructure. So, you know, you have to have all these parts come together, I think, for things to be successful and profitable. Um, and, and we know there's all this apparent demand for chips, you know, all kinds of chips of all sorts of, you know, you know, whether it's NVIDIA's or other, other types of chip, analog chips, you know, you name it, um, you know, and so I, I think there's a lot of devils in the details, I guess is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just getting turned up a little bit, you know, just unearthed, <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, that's for sure, right? I mean, yeah, not all horses are created equal equal in this race. Yeah, some are thoroughbreds. Well, could they be? If they're all equal, we wouldn't have the innovation. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah. So, Jennifer, we are getting very close to the end of this wonderful conversation that we've had with you here today. So, uh, in terms of any kind of closing comments that you would like to make to our listeners, um, I just I just would say that you know just to be mindful and not make quick decisions and and maybe be a little bit patient with letting information reveal itself letting time reveal you know what is true what is what is of value um and and also just you know pick your information sources accordingly and cross reference sources and ask questions um that's that's what i would say um that's sound advice well and that's uh, the purposefulness of having people like you uh, speak and give your insights and your experience which is quite extensive so uh, our pleasure wonderful to see you thank you for your insights and comments and uh, look forward to seeing you in person here in the next several months yeah i know it's going to be exciting in montana in april for our conference but no thanks so much for having me and I, I enjoyed talking to you and, and your audience well, thank you so much. Take care now.